Welcome back to Smallville Season 11 right here at Comic Story. Your home for your favorite comic books read dramatically back to you as an audio drama by a guy who thinks he's an amateur voice actor. Today we're going to be covering Volume 7 of Smallville Season 11. So here's your quick recap. Volume 1 told you where we are in the Smallville universe. Volume 2 introduced us to Batman. Volume 3 told us what happened to Impulse, a.k.a. Bart Allen. Volume 4 introduced us to what happened to Kara, a.k.a. Supergirl and Volume 5 introduced us to Wonder Woman, while Volume 6 told us that there is a crisis coming, a crisis of infinite Earths. And today, we begin Volume 7, simply known as Lantern. If you enjoy these videos, please consider subscribing to our channel. Every Sunday, we bring you another episode of the Smallville comic book series. And now, let's get into our story. Two years ago, energy shoots up from the top of the building into a great swirling vortex. Blue kryptonite? Clark asks, looking at Zod. I told you, I'm not going anywhere. Zod knocks Clark against the wall, trying to stab him with his blade. You knew that blue kryptonite would prevent you from ascending with the others. Better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven, Zod hisses at him. The blade slashes, cutting into Clark's chest, and the two trade blows until they tumble outside, falling beneath the rain. Zod moves to stab Clark, but he stops the blow. Unlike you, I will lead from the throne, not the shadows. And he spits. Every human, including the woman you love, Clark, will kneel before Zod. But Clark knows what he has to do, and he lets the blade sink into his stomach. You destroyed my first home. I won't let you take this one, he tells the man. Clark falls away, taking the blade with him. Zod watches on, a smile on his face, in his moment of triumph. But the light begins to glow around him, and he realizes what Clark did. He's pulled into the air, ascending with the other Kryptonians. No! He bellows into the sky. And he appears in the Argo colony, with the others gathering around him. Sacrificed himself to defeat me. The others gather, thanking Rao for bringing them to the new world beneath a yellow sun. All the better so that we may punish the men who led us to war. One offers as they glare at Zod, but their leaders tell them that they will deal with Zod later. Argo is Krypton's new beginning. Even now, Rao smiles upon us, Vala says, looking up into the sky. And a green light streaks across above them. The flame bird of legend, blessing of our travels, she whispers. The Green Lantern Ring begins to scan the planet beneath it with the population having returned to Sector 2813, and thus its recruitment cycle has begun again. Kryptonian life forms detected. It beeps, scanning closer. Error. Artificial life forms detected. It beeps again. The ring cannot connect with an artificial life form, and so it streaks off into space, searching for a viable Kryptonian recruit. Now we go to the present day over in Metropolis with Oliver Queen staring at his array of weapons on the wall. He can hear them begging to be used. The kind of use that involves free archery at the park on a Wednesday and not the kind that involves trick arrows, right? Chloe asks, coming out of the bathroom in a towel. She stretches her lower back, her pregnant stomach giving her issues. They crawl into bed with Oliver telling her that he just misses the danger sometimes. You think I love riding the bench? She tells him. At least you got to go to Gotham, he points out, and she raises an eyebrow, shocked that he even knew about the trip. You went with Lois, Chloe. The barista at a coffee cart knows you went to Gotham, he jokes. The two sit up, making a promise that if trouble finds them, they won't sit on their hands. We certainly won't be running from a fight, Chloe promises as they lock pinkies. Meanwhile, Lois and Clark are coming out of a movie theater, with Clark seemingly a little down, letting Lois know that he doesn't know if this is the best way to distract themselves. Given the crisis that's on its way, I don't know if we should be seeing a movie, he tells her. But Lois disagrees, which means that we can enjoy the quieter moments while we have them, she replies. Clark nods, kissing her on the forehead, letting her know that she's right. He laughs, taking the popcorn from her. I know we're not married yet, but the least you could do is share. Lois isn't listening to him anymore, though, staring at the glowing green light in the sky. Macrovision it, she orders him. Telescopic vision, he corrects her. But he still can't tell what that light is. It's coming right this way, he tells her, throwing her so that she lands on an old sofa on the curb. The light streaks towards him, causing Lois to yell as it collides with her fiancé. The green light in the flame, they bathe Clark, and he stares around him, hearing a voice. 
If you are hearing this, it means that you have inherited both my ring and my duty, the ghostly image tells him. The image solidifies, becoming an alien in green armor. And then it begins to recite an oath, and Clark begins to speak with him. And the brightest day, and the blackest night, Lois watches as Clark begins to rise within the green light, drifting into the air. No evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern's light! Lois stares at Clark, who is now dressed in glowing green armor. Guess we're going to have to take a rain check on dessert, huh? She says, eyes wide. Kal-El of Krypton, welcome to the core. Meanwhile, over in New York City, the police chase a homicide suspect through the alleyways of the city, and one of the cops chases the perp down on foot. Who is it? One cop asks. Who do you think? The detective turns the corner with the perp opening fire, but the rounds bounce off the green shield that is suddenly appearing. Really wish you hadn't done that, the detective tells him, the green energy glowing in his eyes. The cops watch as the perp comes flying out of the alleyway, a massive green fist striking him in the face. What the hell was that? One officer asks. Beats me, fellas. Though I'm open to suggestions, the detective asks, walking calmly out of the alleyway, the ring on his finger beginning to glow and beep. Detective John Stewart, where'd you get that ring stone? One of the cops asks, and he tells him, you know, guys, it's a long story. And he steps away, placing the ring to his ear. Lantern dispatched to 2814. New recruit in need of orientation and acclimation in your sector. Salak tells him through the ring. John is stunned. Thought we learned our lesson about having more than one human on deck. He asks, flying into the air with a burst of green light. Who says that he's human? Salak asks. But meanwhile, back in Metropolis, Lois asks him. Have you tried heat visioning it off? Yes. He tried heat visioning it off, Lois says into the phone. Freeze breath? Arctic breath, and yes, I did. Suddenly, the massive green tools appear in the air. Okay, Emil, now it's making ghost props everywhere, Lois says on the phone. And finally, Clark is able to pull the ring free, and it launches into space with Lois nodding. He took the ring off, and uh, everything faded, she tells Emil. He chucked it into space. Meanwhile, at Star Labs, Emil nods, tracking the ring as it begins to circle around the moon, and it begins to come back to Earth. Duck and cover, Lois! Duck and cover! He orders her. Lois nods, pointing to the incoming object that is coming to Clark. He launches into the air, colliding with the ring in a giant ball of green light again. Oliver notices from the window and tells Chloe that he's going for a jog. So, Lois notes, staring at Clark in his green armor again. Ring came back, huh? Clark suddenly turns, his hearing picking up an alarm at Metropolis National Bank, and he streaks off into the night sky. The cops begin to open fire, but suddenly Superman appears. Sorry I'm late and don't ask, he tells them about his new green uniform. Ladies and gentlemen, please lay down your weapons, he tells the masked crooks. Suddenly, green missiles appear around him, aimed at the crooks and their mech. The missiles begin to explode, forcing the criminals to run. The mech then launches its own rockets, aiming at the Man of Steel. Clark catches it, but suddenly a massive green Superman appears and pounds his fist into the mech. The criminals come running out, giving themselves up to get away from Superman. Uh, apologies, everyone, he tells them sheepishly. I promise I'll get this all cleaned up when I get my new skill set in order. He then flies away, looking at the destruction he called. Tough first day recruit? John Stewart asks, floating in front of him. We need to talk. Meanwhile, back at the crime scene. Superman's green now? Oliver asks the cops. He tries to get some information of the crime from the cops, but they don't seem to be forthcoming with it. Meanwhile, back at their hideout, the crooks who got away enter. I heard the super foiled the heist, their boss says, and they nod, letting him know that they just made the distraction work better. He nods, picking up a weapon and shooting it at the human targets in his range. You'll find your fees have been transferred into your various offshore accounts, he tells them, and they nod. Fearfully heading towards the door as they let him know that the cops confiscated the mech, Prometheus nods, looking at the vast armory around him. Somehow, I think I'll manage. Clark, meanwhile, is looking at the projection that has appeared all around them. The projection of a destroyed world. Why me? He asks, and Lantern Ray stares out over the destruction. If you are experiencing this sentient message from my ring, I have fallen defending Krypton from destruction. The projection tells him, My sector, my duty, is now turned over to you. Lantern Ray tells him that life must be returned to the sector, forcing the ring to find a new recruit. Right, so what is this place? Clark asks, looking around the world, and Ray shows Clark the home world of Oa, home of the Guardians in the Green Lantern Corps. Clark looks and sees a group of robots glowing with green light. The cosmic entity known as Parallax infected one of the Guardians, 
and repossess the Manhunters as a weapon of fear, Ray tells him. Earth's first Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, was compromised. Possessed by Parallax, he turned on his compatriots. Ray tells Clark that Parallax decimated the Green Lantern Corps. Where once there were thousands of lanterns to police the stars, there are now hardly a dozen. You among them, he tells him. But Clark shakes his head, telling the projection that Earth is his home. You are assigned to Sector 2813, Lantern of Krypton. The projection ends and Clark is once again standing in the watchtower. That's not how this works, Superman, John tells him. But the group doesn't understand. How does the ring choose who has the capacity for the strongest will? You're saying that you're more strong-willed than me? Lois asks, and Tess questions how Alan Scott came in contact with the ring so long ago. But Clark interjects again, questioning what right the ring has to forcibly conscript sentient beings into service. Orders are orders. You're now a soldier, Superman, John tells him. You're one of us. Meanwhile, somewhere in the vastness of space, an asteroid floats before a great star. Within, the Manhunters detect multiple Green Lantern signatures in one place. Terms of agreement violated. They begin to chirp, their eyes glowing with yellow light. One supposes that it was only a matter of time, a creature growls from the shadows. Go, my faithful, squash the resurgence, let them know, fear! Back at LexCorp, Lex is sitting at his desk questioning why none of the other Lex Luthers in the multiverse have reached out to him. Maybe you're the last Mr. Luther in existence, Otis tells him trying to help. Thanks for your optimism, Otis. Luther answers, and he stares at his screen, trying to figure out a way to get back to the monitor ship. What if the thingy we took from the guy? Otis begins forcing Lex to turn on him. The comm units from the dead monitor, yes. I can't wait to see where this goes. But Otis just stares at him for a moment. What if we just put in a bigger battery? He replies, and Lex stares at him for a moment before smiling. Put a meeting on the books with Cord and Holt. I may have spoken too soon when I turned down Wayne's offer to join them in their super collider endeavor. He tells his assistant, Otis nods, pulling out his phone, and Lex turns on the news to watch the coverage of Superman and his new powers. And the report shows a close-up of the ring, the symbol. I know that symbol, but from where, he wonders. Meanwhile, at the Fortress of Solitude, Clark tries another blasphemous ring, getting nothing. You understand my frustration here, right, John? He wonders, and Stewart nods behind him. It's natural, but it doesn't mean you can let it get to you. Clark nods, looking at the ring. Explain to me again how imagination is tied to will. John shakes his head, not really understanding the question. In the heat of battle, why bother taking the time to manifest a wrecking ball instead of just firing a regular energy blast? It's the same energy, right? It has the same effect, and he demonstrates by firing a blast of green energy at the ice. John shakes his head, not having a good answer for Clark. It's not our place to question the rules, he tells him, and Clark nods, telling John that he isn't really debating tradition. But I'll be damned if I'm going to spend the rest of my life with a weapon stuck on my hand and I don't know a thing about it. John nods, noting that they don't have an expert to consult. The two of them take to the skies, and Superman tells them that they may have the next best thing. So meanwhile, over at the Watchtower, Tess is looking at Oliver and Chloe. Didn't you say that you were abstaining from hero work? She asks, holographic eyebrows raised. I didn't say anything about hero work. Did you, sweetie? Oliver asks, looking sideways at his wife. Of the many words that I've said, I don't believe those were two of them. Chloe nods, and Tess looks at them both, noting that while Clark is dealing with the alien tech, she is willing to let this one slide. But I have my eyes on you, she tells them. She informs Oliver of his theory of the heist being a fake was accurate. With several heists taking place in nondescript buildings, they all lead back to the DEO. Our thief stole from the DEO, Oliver muses. And at Star Labs, Emil questions whether John knows where this ring's power comes from. Nothing more than what I've said, he tells them. And you've worn the ring for how long? A decade, Stewart shrugs. Emil nods, turning to show the charts that appear on the massive screens. As my team can giddily attest to, the technology is ancient, predating anything here on Earth, he tells them. What's interesting is that the rings don't generate the emerald energy of will. The ring slinger does, John nods, and Emil shakes his head. The rings enable the user to tap into the power beneath the fabric of reality. He tells them. He turns back to Superman and John, telling them that everything that they know about the ring seems accurate. My mind seems to filter and implement this energy. The signature of the EM spectrum is distinct, so much so that we can track it in local space. He nods, pointing to the screens, which show two green dots standing in the room. Suddenly, another scientist rushes in, letting them know that similar yet not identical energy signatures are converging in the lab. Mr. Stewart, did you invite company? Emil asks, turning back to the heroes as the green armor appears. No, Doctor, I did not, John tells him as their rings begin to beep a warning. 
The two lanterns fly outside and Clark questions if the rest of the lanterns are arriving. The ring wouldn't go into an alert for a pep rally, John tells him, and then stops short. No, that's not possible. He whispers as he looks at the group of Manhunters floating before them. Meanwhile, over at the Daily Planet, Lois and Oliver sit before the screen, video chatting with Steve Trevor and Diana Prince. Trevor lets them know that despite the intruder knowing where to hit their warehouse around the CCTV cameras, they didn't know to avoid their mystics. The images that flash over the screens are of Prometheus. Sinister much? Overcompensating is more like it. Oliver scoffs. Oliver believes the man to be a danger considering the amount of tech that he stole from DEO, and Trevor nods to that. His face is hidden and his MO is new on our end. I've dispatched Agent Chase and a field team your way, he lets them know. Mr. Queen, you and your alter ego are authorized to join. Are you going to suit up, Oliver? Lois asks, looking at her friend, when suddenly a green light streaks by the window, followed by a yellow. Nice to know that Clark's keeping busy, Oliver notes. Over the city, though, the ring trips a warning to Superman. Warning lock, warning lock. Incoming! Stuart yells, and both men throw up a green shield, but the missiles strike them, shattering the shields, sending both lanterns crashing into the buildings. That shouldn't have happened. Stewart tells him, and Clark quickly catches the rubble before it falls into the streets. We have to get these manhunters away from the populated areas before anyone gets hurt. Superman tells him, and John nods, launching his own missiles back at the manhunters, but they keep coming. On me, Lantern Stewart! Clark orders as both men streak upwards into space. They lead the manhunters to the moon, but John begins to smash them with a giant hammer, and both men turn to stare to see if the manhunters are being defeated. And that's when they suddenly emerge from the crust of the moon, robotic hands grasping our heroes. A congregation of lanterns violates the treaty. A congregation of lanterns violates the treaty. The robots repeat over and over. What are you talking about? Clark questions. I wish I knew. John growls and the group of new drones arrive on the scene with Clark patching through to the watchtower. Gentlemen, this might need a woman's touch. Tess tells them over the radio, launching her drones into the fight. One of the Manhunter's faceplates begins to get knocked loose, revealing the yellow ring within. And John is shocked for a moment until ordering Clark to fall back. Yellow, fear, counteracts will. That's why our rings can't make a dent on them. He tells his partner and Clark nods, ordering the watchtower to duck. He fires his heat vision into a circle, quickly destroying the remaining Manhunters. He then turns to John, asking if that's the last of them. There's always more. Meanwhile, Mrs. Hunkle enters the room, bringing in a tray of tea, and Lex smiles at her from the table, apologizing for barging in. I read about the Justice Society, and I know the hour is quite late. He smiles at her. But if you don't mind, I'd like to know more about the Green Lantern. While Lex is looking into the Alan Scott Green Lantern, back on the moon, John and Clark stand before the projections of the other lanterns. Lantern Stewart, I have repeatedly stated what remains of Owen archives bears no evidence to any treaty having been broken with the Manhunters. Clark nods, asking if the information could have been destroyed in the archives, but the lantern shakes his head, for he was the archivist before their destruction. I assure you both, there was no treaty. Lantern Aya breaks in, wondering if the Manhunters are merely rogue units but John shakes his head. Then how were they running off yellow rings instead of emerald ones, he questions, and Clark questions the yellow rings, citing that he's the new guy. The Lanterns explain that the Guardians created the Yellow Lanterns as shock troopers to combat the Manhunters, when the Manhunters began to experiment with whole populations. Citizens are terrified, which makes the Yellow Corps stronger as they arrive to combat the Manhunters. Clark finishes, but the Lanterns suddenly look sad, telling Clark that the Yellow Corps drew out of the being known as Parallax. The Lanterns begin to drift away, citing that John and Clark must return to their sectors. The Manhunters are swarming Earth, John cries stunned, but the rest disappear, leaving the Archivist alone. John, there's something you should know, something the other survivors of the Parallax War can never learn. Meanwhile, beneath Metropolis, the DEO team is moving through the subway tunnels, when suddenly the tunnel is filled with green light as Oliver Queen pops a flare. Director Trevor gave me the go for a ride-along. He smiles, and the commander nods at him, wondering what a millionaire could possibly bring to the team. But Oliver nods, shooting a smoke arrow to show the laser grid that blocks their path. Who do you think disabled the traps that you already walked into? He asks of the smirk. So the team moves forward, their lights finally playing on Prometheus in the shadows. Drop the guns! Agent Chase orders, and the man smiles, dropping the guns, but they explode in a flashbang, blinding the group. I can still hear you! Oliver yells, drawing his arrow and he fires the bolt sticking into the wall behind Prometheus. It pops open, creating a beeping sound. Aim for the sound, 
He orders to the soldiers, and the DEO agents open fire, but Prometheus moves fast, throwing his own sound wave machine to the floor with a rippling sound, knocking the agents down, and he one by one moves through the group, dispatching them. He drops Oliver last, taking him out with a few well-placed kicks and punches. Game on. He smirks, and the tunnel is filled with an echoing boom as a tube opens up and the villain disappears. Meanwhile, Clark and John are flying through the fastness of space. I can't believe that they lied to all of us. After everything that we went through, Stuart fumes. The two men enter an asteroid, shocked as a dark voice reaches their ears. John Stewart, I could taste your fear before I saw it in your eyes. The massive dark being known as Parallax hisses. His jaws twisted into a smile with Clark staring stunned at the creatures that seem to be held in the creature's chest. Are those? Yes, those are the guardians. John tells him, nodding at the blue-skinned aliens, but Parallax hisses. They offered themselves to him. A treaty. Their fear was an eternal fuel to feed my hunger, with the promise of never being hunted again. Black tendrils snake out, wrapping around Clark and John as they explain. The treaty was not violated. Lanterns are gathering to destroy me! Parallax snaps, but the being pulls Clark in as he tries to explain. Tell me, Kryptonian, how many lives would you fear to lose if I feasted on your adopted world? The being opens his jaws wide and yellow rings begin to rain forth. Perhaps it's time I started my own core! And that concludes part one of the Lantern Chapters of the Smallville Universe. Where is this going? Well, it's going to be fun. And I hope you guys are enjoying this. We're going to be bringing you Smallville every Sunday right here at the YouTube channel. And don't forget, you can catch me recording stuff like this live over at my personal Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash eligible monster. If you want to keep up to date with our schedule, please consider subscribing to our channel. Hit that bell for notifications. And I'll see you guys next time right here at Smallville Sundays, where the fun is just getting started.